Hello everyone. I'm Aaron, a birding naturalist. Welcome to my channel. It is June and in part that means Pride Month. So let's talk about the science behind the evolution of homosexuality a bit. Homosexuality, kind of on the surface, does present a, like a bit of a paradox. Because if natural selection has, as one of its major drivers, the idea of passing genes down from one generation to the next, then a mating system where some individuals don't produce offspring or a lot of offspring seems like would be unfavorable in light of evolution. It seems like natural selection would favor against individuals that pursue that kind of strategy. And yet, homosexuality is exactly that. It's where members of the same sex are attracted to each other, engage in same-sex sexual interactions, which do not generally uh, yield offspring. And yet, it's super common. It's hugely widely found. In half of mammal families, there has been observed homosexuality. In 80% of species that have been examined closely, there's homosexuality, which probably means that there's a lot more homosexual behavior than has been observed just because of a lack of observation, a lack of study. And that's just mammals. Homosexual or bisexual interactions have been found. There's a wide, a hugely wide spectrum of sexual behaviors that have been observed across the animal kingdom. It's an incredibly common thing to see in the natural world. So if it's that common, if it's that widespread in mammals and beyond, how does evolution account for that? It's an interesting question. Now, before we get any farther into this subject, a disclaimer. I am not a member of the LGBTQIA plus community. I try to be an ally, but I am not a member of that community. I am outside of that community. And so I'm speaking from a place that is outside of that community. What I am, though, is an environmental scientist with a background in animal behavior and evolution. And so that is an, uh, sort of an angle that I can speak from some personal sort of expertise. And so that's what I'm going to be talking about today. So when it comes to evolution, a lot of times when we're looking at paradoxes like how does homosexual, how does homosexual behavior persist in a population? How does it keep on going year after year, generation after generation? Why is it so common? There are a couple of things to think about, a couple of things to consider. One is from a genetic standpoint, there is no single gay gene that does not exist. There is no one gene where if you have it, you're gay, and if you don't have it, you're not. That's just not how it works. It seems to be much more a combination of a lot of different genes factoring together and playing off each other, interacting in some way. Also, another really important thing to think about is that it doesn't seem to be purely genetic either. There are things called epigenetics, where genes interact with an environmental factor, and like it all plays together in sometimes very complicated interactions that yield an individual. And epigenetics plays a role in virtually every component of life, not just sexuality or anything like that. Everything has to do with epigenetics. And so, being part of life. There are sort of epigenetic gene times natural environment interactions that factor into how a person develops and whether or not they are a member of the LGBTQ community or not. So with all that in mind and a lot of complexity, let's, let's dive in and talk about how 
some of those genetic factors, the, the parts that are genetic, the genes that might account for some portions of how a person develops and why they might end up um, being homosexual, how those could persist in a population and why they might persist and what actual advantages they might actually grant to a species, even if those individuals are not leaving a whole ton of offspring themselves. So one idea is something called the gay uncle hypothesis. Mm, really, it should be called like the gay uncle aunt hypothesis because it works for either. But the idea here is that let's say I was gay. And remember, I'm not, but let's say that I am. I have a very low interest or likelihood of leaving children myself. I'm not going to produce any offspring. But I have a brother. My brother could leave offspring. Now, I share quite a few genes with my brother. And as a result, if my brother has children, I will share quite a few genes with my nieces and nephews. And so if I behave in such a way that helps my nieces and nephews to survive and thrive and leave lots of offspring, then my genes may be passed on to future generations through them. So that's one way that this kind of behavior can be passed on even if I don't leave direct descendants myself. Because some of those genes that get passed on might encourage or result in some of their offspring being gay uncles and aunts themselves. And so, again, persisting this down to future generations. Another hypothesis, and many of these hypotheses are not mutually exclusive, they can reinforce each other. But another hypothesis is that in social species, if there's a certain percentage of individuals that are homosexual, that actually greatly increases the amounts of sort of social interaction, social cohesion, social bonding, alliance forming that occurs within a group. Which means that that group as a whole then does better and so leaves more offspring, including genes that might interact with each other and the environment to result in someone who is gay. So that is another thing, another strong advantage that having homosexuals in a population might yield to a species and why evolution might favor it in the long term. And there's another reason, another idea behind homosexuality and why it might be advantageous. And that is actually, it's not quite homosexuality, it's bisexuality. There is a, a hypothesis called the bisexual advantage hypothesis. And this states that, you know, everything's in a spectrum. And if you look at the natural world, actually, that sort of plays out. Pretty much everything is on a spectrum. There's tall and short. There's like spectrums of everything. And sexuality, quite possibly, is one of those things. And so maybe this isn't really a binary thing. Maybe evolutionary biologists shouldn't be, in, be envisioning this as a binary, oh, you're either heterosexual or homosexual. Maybe that's not really what's going on. Maybe if you look across the animal kingdom, it's more like some bisexuality combination is actually the norm and actually might yield the most advantages rather than the extremes, either extreme, of that spectrum. And there are reasons to support this. There, there's ideas out there and evidence out there that support this idea. There are tons of animals that display bisexuality in some way. There uh, is an animal called the gray-headed flying fox, which is an Australian fruit bat. And these bats are sort of seasonally homosexuality and seasonally heterosexual. During the breeding season, breeding season, males and females all group together and they pair off and they have babies. But during the non-breeding season, they split into basically male-only colonies and female-only colonies. And during the non-breeding season, same-sex sexual interactions have been observed in both the male colonies and the female colonies between same-sex individuals. And then, 
breeding season comes around again, the population's all mixed together. And so the cycle repeats year after year after year. There are animals like bottlenose dolphins that have a huge amount of flexibility and fluidity with their gender expression and their sexuality. Yes, absolutely, males and females mate with each other, but males often form long-term sexual relations with other males. Females do as well. And it just kind of morphs back and forth. White-tailed deer also do something similar, where, again, it just seems very fluid over the course of the year and individual to individual. And so across the animal kingdom, some sort of variation, which allows for a lot of bisexuality, might actually be the norm. And it kind of is the best of both worlds, where <clears throat> it produces offspring, so evolution continues, you create the next generation, cool. But also, you gain the advantages of that social cohesion, alliance forming, bonding uh, components that having homosexual individuals in your population encourage. So I think it's a really interesting example, a really interesting hypothesis, and I'm really curious to see what more research is done on the whole topic of the bisexual advantage hypothesis and also just homosexuality in nature and how homosexuality can evolve. So like I said, I've, I'm mostly focused in this video on the genetic components, but I really do want to stress that there is no single gay gene and also there is a whole complex interaction of genes and environment that people are just scratching the surface of when it comes to research and it's a really interesting topic and I think that there's a lot of great discoveries to be made in that area. But for here and for now, talking about some ways that kind of address this apparent evolutionary paradox and maybe actually show that it's not a paradox at all, I think would be useful and hopefully uh, interesting to you. And, and I, I really want to state that if you are a member of the LGBTQ community, obviously you're part of the natural world. There are members of that community in virtually every species, all over the planet, and a very interesting, a very advantageous, a very natural part of the world. And if you either are or are not part of the LGBTQ community, I hope that some of this information in this video <clears throat> helps you to understand how evolution works, how evolution and, and uh, homosexuality might interact, and helps you maybe have some talking points to discuss this with others. So thank you very much for the view. Subscribe to the channel. Happy Pride Month. And until next time, enjoy the natural world.